a lot of who I am is about is about that. The lessons I learned in in elite sport, yeah, team yeah. sport. Yeah. How on earth did you balance a career, a mm. fledgling career at yeah. that, with being an elite athlete? It's a tr it's a tricky one. It was yeah. it was never an easy balance. I can recall a specific weekend when I lost balance, and that was it's the first time I've actually done a resume. And I sent my resume out to, I don't know, a hundred, a hundred companies. It wasn't an easy process to go through to get that job to to find to find a company that respected that. I just think they took a chance on you. We talked about it later with the with the people there, and it was uh, attitude. Uh, uh, so it was it was nothing to do with technical competency. Yeah, put it that way. Matthew Perry. A visionary leader known for his ability to build purpose-driven, agile and high-performing teams that consistently deliver exceptional business outcomes. With an impressive career spanning nearly 40 years, Matthew has made significant contributions to renowned organisations such as Lendlease, Boehringer, Dulux Group, Oroa, Bluescope, Melbourne Water, Lad Associates and most recently with Inc. IT Solutions. Here's a fun fact about Matthew. He spent 10 years as national representative player for Volleyball Australia. Now, a chance for a point. Yes! The new boy, Steve Perry, wins it. Curious to hear more? Tune in as we chat with Matthew Perry. His positive energy and charismatic stories are truly one of a kind. All right, Matthew, thank you. Thank you for joining me today. Thanks for the invite. Um, you have had a fabulous and diverse career that has seen you, I think, travel, work, compete mm -hmm. uh, in just about every every corner of the globe. Mm. Um, so I'm really interested to hear all about this today and the, and the lessons uh, that, as you've gone through this. Let's Ooh. start where it all began. Yep. Uh, so where where did it all begin for you? What was where a young did Matthew? it all begin? <laughs> yeah. um, what were you uh, dreaming of? Well, um, uh, the the son of lifelong learners. Mm. Um, my parents, uh, initially my father, were teachers, and uh, I was born in the Wimmera Base Hospital, which you're yep. familiar with? Nope. Nope. In Horsham. We <laughs> okay. lived in Matoa when I was uh, born, yep. up, up in the wheat fields, uh, far west of uh, Victoria. Yeah. And uh, where Dad was a, a, a teacher of seven or ten grades in the one classroom. Wow. Uh, and so my early education was involved in sitting in the back of that classroom. Yeah. And... Um, and from there, um, as, you know, we were we, we were fortunate to have had uh, parents that were lifelong learners, mm. uh, curious uh, and uh, intrigued by the world, mm. uh, and uh, and so subsequently they moved from or we moved from Australia to Canada, uh, back to Australia. Then my parents lived and worked in uh, the U.S. Canada for uh, um, China for three years, uh, wow. the UK, uh, Russia for a year. Um, so all over the world. You're uh, making these moves with them through um, this. Half of them, we yeah. were with them, uh, yeah. older brother and younger sister, and uh, half the time not. Uh, so we grew up in a in a yeah. that that was normal for us. Obviously, this this uh, yeah. what many would consider to be quite a complex and. Uh, mm. Uh, world uh, not tethered to any particular location, but uh, but attached to lifelong learning. Yeah. You, you also learn a lot of skills through that. And then we had another mm -hmm. guest. I forget who it was now, but they they made a some number important of, guest who you've forgotten. I've completely forgotten. Right, perfect. Don't, we don't need to draw attention <laughs> to that. <laughs> um, no, it, it, we were talking about that, but in terms of building those life skills through pro-social behaviours mm. of settling somewhere new, making new friendships, yep. connections. Yep. Um, could you, do you have memories of that as a sort of child in terms yeah, of absolutely. landing somewhere and thinking, right, yep. who are my mates and how do I, how do I well, establish uh, myself? Well, later on, much later on in my career, um, uh, my wife and I made a habit of it. And so we uh, we also uh, lived and worked all around the world and, yep. uh, and moved many times in many different countries. Um, uh, and, uh, and it became normal for us, yep. I suppose. First thing you do is walk around with a bottle of wine and a box of chocolates to the neighbours. Yep. First thing, uh, and introduce yourself uh, to the new neighbours. Yep. And uh, and you'd quickly discover who you were going to have a lasting relationship with or not, if the door yep. opened and closed with the gifts or whether you were invited in. Um, uh, and uh, and then we had a couple of um, uh, particular passions. That, so my wife's a botanical artist, okay. so she could engage with the local um, artist community yeah and uh and me with sport i would engage that local yeah. sporting community and, and you know gain connections 
you know, through that. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. But, but in, always embracing the new cultures, the diversity. Yeah, loving. Well, the well that's why you move right. I think it's yeah, uh, the diversity of challenge and culture and. Uh, yeah, I, I see a lot of people will, will kind of relocate to a different country and then they'll try and find the people that have also moved country from the same place. Why would you do that? Yeah, that's right. Eating the same food, yeah. talking the same language, living, yes. Yeah, we observe the same thing. Yeah, but, uh, it's pretty cool. And I guess there's a safety aspect, and not, not physical safety, it is. but just emotional is. safety, let's say a psychological is. safety of yeah, yeah, familiarity yeah. Yes. Um, and some kind of relatability to back home. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, true. Um, foreign to me, I understand it. Yeah. But I, I sort of reject the premise. So yeah. my, as I mentioned, my parents lived in and worked in China for three years at uh, Suzhou University, mm -hmm. um, the only Westerners you know around, yeah. and um, loved it. And then ended up running tours to China for yeah, small well, groups uh, when they when they'd retired. Um, yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah. so uh, yeah, it depends how you approach things, right? Yes, <laughs> right. we, we we've always approached things with an open mind and yeah. natural curiosity. Yeah. yeah, fantastic. Yeah. So I'm going to go to uh, back to the start of your career. Sure. And now when I was researching you, my career, I, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah the work bit. Yeah, That's right. Yeah. yeah. I'm interested in this stuff, but we All will right. we will get there. Um, uh, what I saw early in your career was that it felt like you were kind of edging your bets because I saw mm -hmm. uh, you worked as a, a, a voluntary <clears throat> fireman for the CFA. Mm -hmm. You went to TAFE uh, where you did a diploma mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. architecture, mm -hmm. and you're also playing volleyball mm. uh, professionally. Mm -hmm. And I was sort of looking at this and thinking, were you edging your bets? Were you kind of figuring out which, you're at this kind of crossroads and, and which direction am I going to go? And I'm going to kind of do a, a few different things. So what, mm. what, what was going on? What was going on? It's a bloody good question. Yeah. Um, so some of it deliberate and some yeah. of it not. So uh, uh, community service, uh, we're always, uh, we've been uh, community minded, I suppose. Mm. Uh, lifelong uh, interest in the communities where we live. Um, and so becoming involved in the uh, what the uh, the uh, apartment owners association in Singapore, where we owned an apartment, or the fire brigade where we grew up, or wherever it was, looking to add, you know, to yeah. the community, if you like. Yeah. Um, uh, so there's that part of it, I suppose. Um, uh, the other part, I always wanted to be an architect. Mm. That, that was, you know, from why's that? Um, uh, Mum and dad, I'm sure. I'm sure. I mean, we're 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 shaped by our, our environment, by, by yeah. and and also how we respond to that, probably right. And uh, and we were talking a bit before off camera about the the um, uh, the luck of uh, birth, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Where you were born, and uh, and we've always recognised that we're one of the twenty percent born in circumstances that allow us to have a choice yeah. about uh, career, about where we live, what we buy healthcare, education, all these things. And so we've always welcomed and respected that and and um, and tried to positively exploit it, if you yeah. like. Uh, so, so out of that um, uh, architecture, and then very quickly uh, at the same time in parallel sport. Mm. So that was the, the volleyball. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk yeah. about that bit because mm. it's interesting because you and I spent, I don't know, an hour or so kind of chatting a couple of weeks ago in preparation mm. for this and, and it didn't really come up, mm. uh, which amazed me because I looked at some of your achievements uh, through mm -hmm. your volleyball career and mm. like incredible what, mm. what you did. Thank you. Um, so tell us about that. How did you get into volleyball and kind of yep. where did it take you? Yep. Um, Always played a lot of sport, so um, you know soccer in Canada and uh, baseball and lots of different sports. Basketball when we got back to Australia, and uh, I just love the volleyball because of its its complexity. It's mm. a very very difficult sport to master. Uh, it's always changing. Uh, a confined environment where teamwork is so important, so critical. Yeah. And uh, and some old school friends invited me along when I was. Mm, maybe 16, 17 to a club, club um, volleyball club down uh, the Moynton Peninsula in Victoria and uh, just loved it, fell in love with it, mm. um, made some great friends and then was uh, played club for a little while and then was picked for the state team uh, and then from the state team, the, the, the national team a little while later. Yeah. And um, no, we didn't talk much about it, but it has shaped who I am and my leadership style and, yeah. uh, and everything. So it's a... Uh, and then, um, yeah, a lot of full-time training, part-time training, and I was in the national team for 11, 11 years or so. Mm -hmm. um, and where did that take you around the world, being in the national team? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, well, where, did it, where did it take me? It took me to, 
another level of um, self-awareness. Okay. 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 <laughs> so uh, uh, yes, of course, uh, geographically all yeah. around the world. Yeah. Um, uh, but as a professional athlete, you learn a lot about yourself, your motivation. Mm-hmm. You learn a lot about uh, goal aligned hard work. Yeah. Um, trust, respect, honesty become foundational to who you are. And uh, and elite athletes can't betray it. You know, you know, it's not a mask you can put on, mm. or or uh, a morality you can wear for a while. Uh, particularly team sports, uh, yeah. you're, you're truly found out if you're not if you're not um, completely aligned to these morals and ethics, these foundational elements. Yeah. So uh, so I was very very fortunate to um, uh, to play and be coached by many great people. And had the opportunity to represent Australia for uh, for over a decade. Mm. Um, that's a lot of jumping up and down. Uh, probably half that time it was full time training. So yeah. it's um, um, seven, eight, nine hours a day, five days a week, three or four hours on a Saturday. Sunday was rest day, um, and travelling and touring for six months of the year. Yeah. Um, when I met my my wife to be, uh, and uh, and uh, and we got married three months after our first date, actually. That's, right. That, that's not Didn't bad. Hang about. There's another, there's a whole other story there. <laughs> um, but uh, And then we moved to Sydney two days after, from Melbourne, two days after we were married. And then the next week I was off touring. So that was my wife, Fiona, her induction to, uh, yeah. uh, or introduction, no, in, induction, yeah. into the volleyball <laughs> community, if you like. Yeah. Uh, lifelong friends we both made uh, through that, mm. through that, but... Uh, but so a lot, a lot of who I am is about is about that. The lessons I learned in in elite sport, yeah, team yeah. sport, yeah. and that really is like the. Did the, I get to an answer? Uh, it's a great could answer. Have. No, it's could, a, yeah, could have, maybe. I, I think we could probably do a whole podcast episode just talking about your volleyball <laughs> career because because you then subsequently went on played masters. Yeah, and lo- lo- into lots coaching of other, as well. Yeah, as coaching it, as it didn't well just stop in, no, 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 in terms no. of there, right? As in, it's mm. it's it's pretty much been a part of your life probably since you were yes. late teens. Yes, yeah. Okay. And it has shaped, as I said, my my leadership style, which which many have initially found confusing, not confronting, but confusing. Right. Um, uh, and, then it, and then generally embraced. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. yeah. Elaborate like on that. Well, I'm, well uh, yeah. It's so, way confusing. Well, with, with, uh, uh, with much introspection over, over time, talking about my, uh, my leadership style and uh, and uh, the companies I've worked in have generally found it welcoming. So, um, you know, the, the empowered servant leadership, you know, they, they call it now, yeah. or, it's, or it's labeled now. Um, helping, helping teams um, design a clarity of mission and intent, yeah. and then working together in unity to deliver goals. Yeah. And some of the coaches I've had were about command and control. Mm. Some of the organizations I've worked in are about command and control. Uh, and others, the more positive ones, the more wonderful organizations, yeah. uh, are much more collaborative and, uh, yeah. and empowering and positive. Mm. Yeah. And, and look, I don't know a lot about volleyball, I confess, apart from... There's a net, a ball, (laughs) two players rotating, uh, one of the most popular sports in the world. (laughs) You definitely simplifying it. (laughs) Uh, More specifically, just watching at the Olympics. Mm. And I think what I always find fascinating is A, the athleticism with Mm. volleyball. Um, But the second thing is you've got a bunch of people and you've only got three touches, I believe, before you've got to get it back over the net, right? Correct, yeah. And you've you've got to think and act as a group. Mm -hmm. The communication, I'd imagine, has to be Mm. absolutely clear. Everybody's role in that team has to be communicated. Yes. And you've got a very small amount of time to act upon that. That's right. That's right. Yeah, and, yeah. And then the point's done and bang, you're on to the next point. There's yeah. not much no. reflection in that moment. No. Right. No. And I guess that's what I was when I was. And it's all about the, the team. Really it, about one individual in that team. You, 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 Whereas many other sports can become about the can become about the individual. Correct. Even even soccer. You get one standout player in a team right. and they can make a And the goalkeeper difference. may not even know the name of the striker. Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Mm. Uh, and I'd assume as well probably travelling and being away from home, mm-hmm. you get even closer right, as a group. Um, yeah, all sports do that, uh, yeah. probably. Yeah, um, but uh, I mentioned before, we've made some lifelong friends, some yeah. very strong lifelong friends um, uh, through that uh, shared hardship and all of those things that, uh, you know, more the common 
psychology behind it, if you like. Yeah. Um, but uh, but more than that, it's that that um, aligned sense of purpose. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, when you are when you're training and pushing yourselves until the coach isn't pushing you, you're pushing yourself and you're doing it for yourself and you're yeah. also doing it for your teammates. Um, uh, and instilling some of that in the workplaces I've worked in is is wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned uh, so, some of that confusion. Uh, so sometimes I create deliberate ambiguity because I believe we should be comfortable with ambiguity, yep. clarity when possible. Um, uh, and uh, and inevitably and purposefully, um, I've had so many of the team that I've been a part of um, uh, stand up and become leaders yep. themselves, right? And so it's a wonderful thing until I'm backed out of the organisation deliberately. Um, yep. So it's a it's a true that, that's the, probably the most or definitely the most satisfying part of my work is building these these wonderful positive places yeah. to work, to work in, and the leaders that come from it. Now, whether whether it's a leader in title or not doesn't matter, but, uh, yeah, but okay. people people you know, feeling leader. yeah feeling fulfilled and uh, and owning that success. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What um what would you say is probably that makes pro- sense. It does make perfect yeah. sense. Yeah, I think again that that comes through probably who you are personally right and your personality and your motivators your drivers yeah and it sounds like you know you've you're yep. you're just in the very short time i've been speaking it's very clear your upbringing your your kind of sense of purpose mm. coming through life the the way that you were developed to be inquisitive and curious mm. um, and to work within a team and to to thrive and and, yep. and in that sport yep. sporting yep. world it's it's natural that that's going to radiate through into and mm. it's and again it's it's even interesting as i said when we spend that first hour or so getting to know each other volleyball didn't come up Mm. yet for some people who've achieved the success that you've achieved in sport Mm. they'd be defined and that'd be one of the first things Uh, that they would talk about which i think probably speaks to your humility as well it's uh the 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 pleasure that i get from opening a door to a meeting and being told i'm not needed yep by my team is is supreme i mean there's nothing better than that and uh, and many of the people that I've worked with, if they listen to this podcast or if they don't, they know. Um, uh, there's that wonderful feeling of um, mm. of um, trust, respect, self fulfillment, everything yeah. else, right? Uh, and so this is my role to set people up for success, set people and organisations up for success. Yeah. And I think what you're describing is probably the prototype for modern leadership. Yet many people don't mm. seem to be able to master I think it. Some might be confronted by it. Uh, so I, yeah. I, yeah, I mentioned you know some organisations that work, some it doesn't. Yeah. So uh, a command and control micromanager is confronted by this. I'm expected to know and do everything as a CIO. Yeah. Um, I find that so obnoxious, yeah. so obnoxious. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, um, uh, why wouldn't I set other people up for success so that more people are aligned and we have greater alignment across the whole team delivering great outcomes. Yep. Right. I mean, it is so logical. Yep. Um, not logical if you're confronted by losing control or losing ownership or losing even visibility into what's happening. Mm. Uh, but if you build the trust and respect, and with that clarity of vision and direction, well, then you don't have to know everything. Yeah. No, then, nor should you. No, nor should you. I mean, if you're worried about uh, knowing everything, you're probably not right. executing the that's other right. side. And, and I think you. You and I know. I'm sure um, many people know those those really obnoxious leaders that think they know everything, yeah, um, uh, and uh, and take delight in correcting and steering everything and everybody. Right? Yeah. Uh, um, they wouldn't last one minute on a volleyball court. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, not thirty seconds in the training court, uh, even. Right? Uh, yeah, because uh, because true athletes are lifelong learners. Can you imagine? Yeah. Your so football. You mentioned football. You into soccer, football. Yeah, or? I'm. A, I'm. A, I love sport. And, and so, what team do you support in the EPL or in uh, Australia? I'm, or? I'm born and bred in Southampton. So, so uh, right. can you imagine? Can you imagine the coach using the same training techniques today that they used in the 60s? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Can, the same it's tactics. Unthinkable, right? It's completely yeah. unthinkable. Right? Yeah. That, that's right. I mean, it's bizarre. So it's interesting, actually. Uh, I was talking to my son about this about basketball, mm-hmm. and we're talking about. Uh, the impact of Steph Curry mm. and yes. the way that he came into the game yes. whenever that was 10, yep. 12, 15 years ago whenever that would have been and the way that he used the three point 
uh-huh. shop, yep. which has completely transformed the NBA. Yes. It's a completely different game yes. now to probably it was 20 years ago. Yes. And that was one player yeah, that, the impact. that could have an impact. We talked earlier about one person on mm-hmm. a team having a, an impact on the result. Um, and he did that, but in a positive way, that it made everybody mm. else change change yes. their game. Yes. Um, and for me, that's 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 an elite athlete, someone yeah. that can have that lasting impact yep. that can change a sport. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. It's yeah. um, on that yeah. subject. Uh, mm. Maybe not quite to the standard of Steph Curry, but what was your proudest achievement in volleyball? Proudest achievement to date, because I'm currently coaching two yeah, teams date, and yeah. um, and delighting in how they responded to the to the process that we've just talked about. Um, greatest achievement in <laughs> I don't reflect upon it much actually uh, yeah. uh, honestly um, uh, I, I do I do treasure the learnings mm. uh, that I that I was fortunate to receive and uh, uh, throughout my national career and also state career and club and and continue to learn yeah um, so the biggest learning I'd say is how it's how it shaped me as a person, I would say. Yeah. So how 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 playing elite sport has shaped me in the rest of my life. Yeah. I would say. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So whether that's and I talked about those foundational elements that are just co- become core to to many, the, you know, the trust, the respect, yeah. the honesty. Um, the uh, the constant desire to improve and change and listen and learn, uh, the goal aligned hard work, uh, all of these things, and and I know that they shaped that that has shaped so much of the success I've had in my professional career. Yeah. Uh, and with uh, the wonderful relationships I've had with people in work and socially and and personally as well. Yeah. That's a that's a bit of an obscure answer. If you're after a tournament or a medal, no, no, it was more that probably. What what are you most proud of from your time in sport? Yeah. I suppose rather than greatest achievement wasn't probably was the wrong question. It was yeah. What 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 are you kind of most proud of from yeah. the time? And I think that's yeah. what you've, you've, you've articulated. Proud, mm, proud. Okay, so not <laughs> no, not not proud, but uh, but respectful of all of those things that I've learnt and and today that I'm able to um, pass on what I can to others. Yeah. Uh, whether it's mm. in whether it's in the office or on the volleyball court uh, as well. Yeah. So the teams I'm coaching now, or or the teams I'm involved in in the office. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. It, what I also noticed through your 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 career was from the kind of early eighties. Oh, by the that, way, that's a really good question. I don't get the chance to think about that much. But anyway, yeah, that's yeah. okay. I'm, I'm always just interested yeah. when because I think it is important to um, to reflect. And, I, and, hmm. and uh, for many reasons, but I think often people reflect on the things that they could have done better, um, or areas where they could have improved. Oh, so, which, so for for a few years in the national team, I was a perfectionist. Yeah, which is a no win. Correct. It's a disaster. So I was never happy. How did you overcome that? Uh, a lot of thinking, a lot of introspection, a lot of training, a lot of practice. Yeah. And uh, before I could reconcile to, to. Uh, to performance and perfection, and yeah. and, the, and the balance between the two. So, uh, yeah, beast. If you're a perfectionist, you're never happy. No, I, th- I, th- I think it's one of my, my one of my uh, favorite quotes. Is I'm a recovering perfectionist. I'm, I'm not personally right. I'm a I've, recovering perfectionist. <laughs> yeah, okay. I've, I've, I've never um, I've never suffered that affliction. But uh, oh, yeah. I'm probably more of an optimist um, by, by nature. But as a result. Yep. Probably what I have a tendency to do is reflect on my successes to understand how I can replicate them in the future. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, and, and it's one of my my kind of personal pet peeves when yeah. someone says they got lucky. Oh, you make your own luck. Well, you also can't replicate it. No, no. Right, if you believe that that your success came because of luck. Yes. So if you don't understand the things- Great point. It could be hard work. It could be equipping knowledge. It could be you hired a great team. Yes. It could be because of a number of reasons why you're successful in different things in life. But if you don't understand the essence of what you did- Yeah, yeah. Perfect. You won't repeat it. Perfect. And I I look at sport, business- I think there's a there's a lot of examples of that. Yes, yes, um, yes. So yeah, uh, yeah, that's great. It's um, and I learned that very early on. I, my, mm. my, my background was studying organisational psychology, right? And I read this report about trainee salespeople, uh-huh. and the ones that attributed their success to luck typically uh, didn't didn't last the course because no. they didn't learn. Yes, but the ones that could say, yeah. 
I got I that sale because it. there's of nothing I did. There this, was, this, and this. Yeah, yeah, okay. uh, they knew what they could replicate. Yeah, it's okay. Um, but it's yeah. also that kind of human nature to be humili- humble. You yep. show the humility and kind of say, oh, I got lucky. You, you don't want to kind of maybe take the credit for the things that you did. But if you don't learn from that, um, mm. anyway, so my, so my, my little pet but Very peeve, good. Uh, that's very good, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so what yeah. I was going to ask you is is from the kind of early 80s to the late 90s. Mm. Yeah, okay, um, yeah. 80s, well, let's 90s. Go, yep. let's, go, let's go through that period. But you spent, f- there's a 15-year period there mm. in your resume where kind of CAD, project management, that's architecture right. world, the, the passion that you wanted to go into. Did you read all that? I read everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, I'm, I'm a lifelong learner. I'm a curious mind as well. And, and I'm always just interested to go back through the stuff that people have mm. done. And what I was interested in as I was reading that is I was thinking, how on earth did you balance a career, a mm. fledgling career at yeah. that, with being an elite athlete? Um, balance. I think they complemented each other. They do, but there's a lot of, as you just said, the amount of yeah. hours you were spending training. Yeah competing, yeah. um, yet over here you're also trying to master your career yeah. and set yourself up. Yeah. Um, and the reason I ask this is because I think there's there's uh, probably people that come to the workforce today, mm. they're kind of trying to build their career, and, but they've also mm. got other interests. Yes. And, and I don't think life has to always be about complete sacrifice no. to one thing or the other. No, no, no. And I'm interested, so that's why I'm kind of asking this question, yeah, which okay. is what did you learn from that experience of how you did that? Yeah. That someone potentially could, could learn from today? Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> Sharp and take a breath. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah balance. Um, balance, yeah. It's a, tri- it's a tricky one. It was yeah. it was never an easy balance. Yeah. And and I know sometimes it was out of balance. And I can recall a specific weekend when I lost balance. And that was uh, in, in around 1990 two or three and we were in Sydney uh, might have been three or four and I took our two sons young sons then Dom and Alex uh, into uh, into work in an architectural office where I was the IT manager uh, on a weekend to do work while fee Fiona was at the rocks market yep. working with a friend and and it was that moment that I realised my life was out of balance. Yeah, that was that was not right. Mm. And it's the first time I've actually done a resume, and I sent my resume out to I don't know a hundred a hundred companies, and uh, but of course it's a very particular field I was working in. So uh, architecture, CAD systems, mm. you know, IT networks in architectural offices, so very sort of a defined field, yeah. if you like. Um, lots of work within that field and offers within that field, but I wanted to explore outside that, that field. Okay. And in my interviews with a very strange name pharmaceutical company, <laughs> uh, I, I recall in my very first interview saying I lost my balance I'm determined not to lose it again, mm. and you'll get a dedicated employee, um, a, you know, a committed um, um, member of your team. Um, but I lost my balance, and I never want that to happen oh. again. You're right. So that was that was a defining moment. Then uh, it wasn't an easy process to go through to get that job to to find to find a company that respected that. Yeah, and uh, and then to embark upon a whole new career, uh, primarily in technology. So, yeah. so I saw, if I understood correctly, at that time, you you kind of been working in CAD project management. I give vague and answers, then, don't I? You, you, you're not going to get a specific answer out of me. That's okay. I, no, I, okay. I, I, I like ambiguity, <laughs> yeah, strangely. You do. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a sucker for punishment. I think. <laughs> nice. um, no, but but I guess what I'm trying to get to yeah. before we kind of go into Boringer, because sure. again, it's a fascinating yeah. time in your life as well. But you've been working in CAD, and you then spent a couple of years with um, Buchan Group. Buchan Buchan Group. Buchan Group. That's right. Yes. um, Where you kind of you started to shift into IT management. That's right. So, what triggered your curiosity around? Yeah, yeah, nice. Okay, I can answer that one. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) With a bit more clarity. Yeah. Um, uh, So uh, it was it was the challenge of technology. Okay. You know, there's new technology, crazy technology. You had to know everything about technology to do your work in CAD. Uh, it was a, a field that was clearly going to grow and challenge and learn and 
and evolve yep. and what a fascination at the time you know mm-hmm. enormous fascination so i just had to be involved in that because it was okay. uh really challenging the ways of working the ways of doing the ways of thinking about the future yeah uh at that stage in technology uh, in architecture so you know 3d drawings in cad and, and mm-hmm. this sort of stuff was uh, it was revolutionary yeah and uh so i really wanted to be part of that uh just that natural curiosity well, natural or, or the curiosity i had uh, driving me into that space yeah um uh, and uh brilliant fantastic and i worked with some wonderful wonderful minds mm-hmm. as well uh at that time as well so uh, uh the early days of technology uh, if you like. yeah, it was kind of late 90s but that's, that's the perfect yeah, segue because yeah, yeah. you essentially built on your architecture CAD experience mm. to kind of move in that mm. direction towards IT mm. management. Yeah. And then as you say, you then went off to, to Boeinger where you spent, I think, four, 14 years all up? Yes, something like that, thanks. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you have to okay. trust me on that one. Yeah. Uh, was, <laughs> yeah. um, so there, there was two headlines when I was looking at your time yeah. in mine that jumped out for me yeah. around Boeinger. Um, firstly was your ascent to CIO uh-huh. uh, from coming in a in a, in a sure, kind of IT, yeah. uh, IT management role yeah. and your professional development journey. But there was also the global relocations. Now, I know we mm. kind of touched on those, but there was Singapore, Mexico, Connecticut. Yeah, there was all, uh, all yeah. sorts on there. On, on there. Yeah. Um, so I was interested to talk about the ascent. Right. Uh, first and foremost. Mm. So how were you, I guess, consciously being developed mm. through that time mm-hmm. in terms of your technical skills, but also you as a leader? Sure, yeah. So it was... Uh, so I had retired from the national team then. Yep. Um, uh, so I had this wealth of um, knowledge and experience about leadership and teamwork and these sorts of things, uh, and uh, performance and, and mm. outcome, outcome driven, yep. uh, and uh, and teamwork and lots of other things that uh, that uh, Barry Ingelheim, re- the people there recognised were attributes that they were interested in, yep. uh, and took. And they and I talked about this after a while, uh, a huge risk, a huge risk. They had many traditional technology people applying for the role in in Australia for the uh, leadership of Australia and then ultimately Australia and New Zealand. And uh, they took a they took a chance, took a punt on me and uh, for which I was you know, eternally grateful because it changed our lives as well, positively. Um, uh, and uh, at this, well, you know, why, why do you think they took a chance on you? We talked about it later with the with the people there, and it was uh, attitude. Uh, mm. uh, so it was it was nothing to do with technical competency. Yeah, put it that way. Yeah, yeah. it was all about uh, um, leadership qualities, if you like. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That that's incredibly like at the time mm. you're probably thinking late nineties. Not many companies nope. were bold enough to hire no, in that, absolutely that model. Not. It was absolutely yeah. not. Yeah, yeah. There were there uh, there were people applying for that role. I'm sure that were far more technically qualified than I. Mm. Um, uh, definitely. Oh, I don't didn't have a technical background, um, uh, so uh, you know. I knew what LAN meant and WAN and <laughs> backups and so yeah. on, but I was much more interested in the value that that could deliver, yeah. the commercial value uh, mm. or the organizational value that that technology could deliver. Yeah. Uh, probably that starts from architecture as well. You know, you're looking at uh, you know design and output and, yeah. uh, and value uh, delivered, uh, whether it's a, a drawing or a building. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So, uh, so aligning that to the professional sport and all of those different um, criteria, if you like. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, we laughed laughed some time later about uh, about the you know the the risk they took um, that uh, that they recognised but but embraced. So uh, yeah. so I was uh, very grateful for that for that opportunity. Um, and it was there that I met my first business. A professional mentor as well at, at Barry Ingelheim, but um, what, what what did that look like? What did that? Well, he, yeah, yeah, he. What did he look like? Yeah, well, as no, a no, large man. <laughs> um, no. how, did, how did that look in terms of what, what did that person? Uh, yeah, Dr. Hans Aufhaus. Yeah, okay. uh, yeah. Uh, uh, just a lovely, lovely man. Is is unfortunately passed away um, uh, quite a few years ago now. But uh, but um, uh, someone who. I remain to have the, the deepest respect for. Just a, a really beautiful man, um, of an incredibly intelligent man, um, and he was the the two IC out of Germany. 
Yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, and uh, we became, I would say, good friends. Uh, and uh, and he helped me with my career at Bering at Ingelheim as well, um, yeah. because he liked what he saw in me, um, yeah. uh, you know, uh, what I did, how I did it, and the potential that I offered uh, as well. C- can you remember some of the specific advice that he gave you? We talked a lot about culture and organizations and leadership. Yeah. So we didn't talk about technology and, no. and I, even though he could easily have you yeah. know, uh, directed me with all things technology. Um, uh, we spent much more time talking about uh, building great teams and how to deliver great outcomes. Um, uh, and, uh, and he did it with a vastness of corporate knowledge that I did not have. Um, uh, and uh, and even cultural awareness that I had yet to gain as, as well, yeah. Uh, but um, yeah. So many many uh, and uh, and all the time, uh, I was completely transparent, completely open because that's the way you learn, yeah. right? No pretense, uh, just natural curiosity and uh, and uh, embracing the truth uh, yeah. uh, with great um, candor, if you like. Um, uh, which I know he and many others at that company appreciated as well, um, uh, because that then helps others, setting others up for success as well, if I don't pretend to know everything. You know? Yeah. yeah. And you, you moved through a number of, of different roles there. Hmm. Um, yeah. how, did you, how did you go about finding those opportunities, or did those opportunities come to confuse you? Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, so one, one we jointly created, and that was the first regional role uh, or bigger regional role in Singapore and um, uh, working with all of the other um, heads of IT and CIOs around the region we thought uh, so uh, burying a, at that time was uh, uh, I would call it a completely autonomous geographically and functionally organization so functionally the organization worked autonomously and geographically as well yeah. And uh, we saw an opportunity collectively together to um, work, deliver better outcomes if we work closer together. Yeah. And uh, whether that meant infrastructure or business systems or processes or um, activities or priorities or whatever it may mean. Yeah. Um, and so I think I co authored with a number of other of my peers a paper that suggested we could do better regionally. Yeah. Um, uh, and. Um, and I can't recall the exact timeline, but it was presented to Professor Professor Schumacher, um, uh, who was the, the global CIO at the time. Yeah. And uh, he liked the model. Hans Aufhaus liked the model. Yep. Uh, and uh, and so from that, I recall we went to a conference. I was at the conference. Professor Professor Schumacher asked me. Um, uh, you know, we had a good conversation. Uh, and uh, asked me if I, if you know, if I'd consider moving to Singapore. Yeah. And um, I rang Fee from Germany or wherever we were, I can't remember, and said, uh, you know, he would move to Singapore. Yes. So Fee and I similarly lean forward okay. and say yes to most things. We yeah. never lean back, arms folded, and say no. Our first response is to lean forward and say, you know, yes. Yeah. And um, so I, I spoke to, to, uh, uh, Professor Schumacher again and said, look, yes, I mean, we'd be interested. And by the time I'd got back to Australia, you know, two days later, the country manager there said, "said oh, so you're moving. <laughs> so it was a done deal. Yeah. Uh, so some months later, I was in Singapore and uh, and uh, a month or two later, Fee and their two boys followed us to Singapore, followed yeah. me to Singapore and, uh, and, um, and we achieved that region. We achieved remarkable success. Yeah. It was a fabulous professional time for us. Um, mm. uh, me, the team we built in Singapore, and the broader Asia Pacific team, you know, just just really, really wonderful. Um, very successful commercially, very successfully uh, um, uh, adopted, the region adopted the, the systems, the processes, the methodologies, you know, what we did, how we did it, everything. So uh, it was a really wonderful, so successful that that the Middle East wanted to join the same hub and then Africa as well, even though they're in the same time zone as Germany. But it was, uh, uh, so uh, we had a fabulous time and delivered great success through, through that same 
um, leadership model and that same team model as well. Yeah. When you're enjoying that success in your career, it's very mm-hmm. easy to try and hold on to it for as long as you can. Um, yes. How did you know yes. when it was when the time was up? Yeah, that's a good yeah good point. So, yeah. uh, um, well, for me, we developed such a beautiful team there, and and the outcomes across all of those countries were were not just accepted but embraced by all of the countries. So it, it's it's a big move for organisations to, mm. you know, to centralise or regionalise in any aspect generally because you know people losing control and ownership and yeah. you know all all the fear that goes along with it. But uh, but we developed up such a great um, collective culture across that whole region um, uh, that everyone was embracing it and gradually. I was able to step back further and further as more yeah. and more people came on to take ownership of the various parts. Uh, so whether that was the finance people or the or the HR people yeah, or the, okay. the business analysts or whatever it was, and uh, which is always my desired outcome. Uh, yeah, as well. Was that the first time you created essentially backed yourself out the door? Hmm. Uh, yes. I've got, I've got. That's I've right. Got, yes. I've got this image in my head of you rocking up to work on a Monday and opening up your diary and it's empty and done. That's and right. Like, oh, so perhaps I'm done here. So, so, <laughs> that so, would so me today. So, so pre- pretty much right. Uh, and it, it, it was a lot a delight. Yeah, it was an a- absolute delight. You know, um, it would horrify me to think that I was just sort of clinging onto some role. You know, mm. but not. But some people do. Yeah, right. yeah, 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 and I'm not, oh, hey, I'm not hey. pointing fingers at anyone. No, 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 But it's, right. it, particularly when you've moved country and you're having a great time, and you've made, yep. you know, it's hard to kind of imagine. Okay, well, now we're going to rip this up again. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No. It's unsettle a, this. It, it's a. Y- you're it's, right. It, it's the right decision, but it's a brave yeah. decision. Yeah. Uh, so thank you. Uh, I, I understand you to be right. I understand that to be the normal response. Um, I totally respect that. Mm. Absolutely, no, no qualms at all, no, no dissent at all. Um, not for me. Yeah. I just couldn't have imagined what just staying there and that's it. You know, even though the heavy lifting was done, even mm. though the team was in place, so then I'd be undermining what we've done if I stayed. Yeah, if that's what we're saying. Yeah, just just for my own mm. comfort. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, so foreign to me. Um, so out of that, my schedule is going to be all mic'd up here, but. Uh, but an offer, no, that was, I think my name was put forward by by Hans again. Um, uh, there's some work needed doing in Mexico. Yep. Uh, the work was similar to the work needed, that was needed to be done in Singapore some six years prior. Um, uh, and uh, I, I don't want to suggest that that six years was all um, uh, rosy. You know, the first year was just selling the prospect to country managers, right? Yep. Who, who had complete autonomy of decisions and had their local CIOs in, uh, uh, acting independently and so on, right? So it was yep. uh, quite a lot of, you know, they call it heavy lifting. It was uh, uh, actually quite a lot of delight in expressing, uh, you know, a new model, if you like, and then delivering that. Uh, and so through that process, uh, we identified what worked and how to do it. And so that was my job in Mexico. And that was uh, that was seven or eight months in in Mexico, um, a, a wonderful time as well, um, and uh, and always confronting because I can be a little bit intimidating when people first see me, you know the sort of imposing figure and the fierce stare. Yeah. Uh, but actually, uh, uh, only in fact uh, only assume positive intent with something we developed in Singapore uh, together. So. Um I have the advantage. I'm jumping here. everywhere, aren't I? No, no, this is great. No. Uh, I, I have the advantage of actually also running a business in Mexico. Uh, no, where over here in, in, uh, in Mexico City, which is just fabulous, isn't it? it I it's mean, a beautiful the, the place. architecture, the food. The, but yeah. what I'm interested in is yeah. it's culturally so different. So different. The whole of South uh, yes. Latin America, South America, my yep. experience of that time, yep. so different to what you would have experienced Absolutely. in Singapore and Australia. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. So how did you so respect that? How did you figure that out? So respect it. Yeah, totally. Uh, and this was also what Hans and I used to talk about as well. Um, uh, so how to positively exploit those different cultural attributes as well, okay. and to respect it and, and mm. positively exploit it. Right. Yeah. So uh, in Singapore, we built up a deliberately multicultural team. We even introduced some rules. Uh, 
uh, you're new to the team in Singapore, you're going to communicate with a region, um, validate your communication with someone from a different culture first. Mm. Right? D- just to understand that what you're saying may I be like misinterpreted, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, even if we express the notion of always assume positive intent and we live by it, let's just make it easy. Let's um, let's make this easier, right? Um, I recall arriving in Mexico and and writing on um, butcher paper a whole stack of uh, Australianisms. Yep. Uh, I bought I bought in my time uh, probably around four hundred copies of the um, the Lonely Planets Australian Slang Dictionary. It's a little sort of A5 pocket book yeah. and deliberately uh, you know, distribute it to, yep. to everybody. And also buying around 100 copies of um, uh, Cultures and Organisations, Software of the Mind by Gert Hofstetter. Uh, and uh, a lot of the theories have been disputed or uh, since, but, but um, the, the value systems of different cultures. Yeah collectivism versus individualism mm-hmm. and you know, all these different things, right? Enough, I'm no expert, but enough to recognize that cultures are different, organizations yeah. are different, people are different. And with my experience embracing that difference, yes. welcoming, delighting in that difference. Um, and so becoming almost culturally agnostic myself, yeah. Uh, even uh, modifying speech patterns so that people can understand me. Yeah. Uh, and uh, after a week, starting to build that same attitude in Mexico. Yeah. So, uh, uh, which I take delight in because that's setting people up for success again and organizations. Mm-hmm. So, uh, um, as you pointed out, vastly different cultures. Yep. Right. Um, People generally at their core appreciate being trusted and respected and being mm-hmm. empowered, uh, building up a vision and a plan and a direction and roadmaps and architecture together, uh, all of these sorts of things, right? That, that is universal, if you like. Yes. Right? Um, how it's expressed, designed, communicated, workshopped, different. Yep. Yep. Um, but, uh, but finding out what those triggers are. You know, the different success metrics of different cultures. Absolutely. Uh, these sorts of things. Yeah, that's that's what I take delight in. Yeah. Well, in, in, in you, sounds, you would have experienced the same. Right? Look, it's, absolutely. Yeah. And, it, and it sounds like, you know, you very much became a student of that cultural diversity. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, um, nice. And I, and I think, you know, yeah. I, I can't remember, sorry, the, the author you referenced there, but um, Hos, Hosved? Hofstede, yeah. 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 Um, th- there's another guy, Fons Trompenar, um, that mm-hmm. also does yeah. a lot of work around cultural differences. Right. Yeah. Uh, but specifically, he presents different cultures with dilemmas. So the difference okay, with a decision going. and a dilemma, if you've come across this, yeah. is the, the notion, a decision, um, if you have unlimited resources, mm-hmm. you can resolve. Right. A yeah. dilemma, yes, okay. all, the, all the resources in the oh, world, interesting. you can't yes, resolve. Yes, yes. So the example could be you're, you're in a car, yeah. your best friend's driving, they're speeding, they're involved in an accident, yeah. you're the only witness. Right. It goes to court. Do yes. you lie for your friend or do you tell the truth? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a dilemma. So who, who asked these questions all around the world of different cultures to try and unpack Fascinating. the way that different cultures yes. would perceive um, the situation. situations, yeah. dilemmas, yeah. Uh, understanding what loyalty means, what yes. trust means, respect. Yes. Fascinating work. Totally. Um, and I know at the time, I actually saw Fon speak in London yeah. just before I went overseas. Did you? And yeah. uh, it blew my mind, but it really made me appreciate the differences because uh, from there, I was yep. also I was actually living in Texas. Right, um, had a team oh, in Canada. Yep. So, so yes, yeah, so you and I have yes. got a bunch of a, a bunch of <laughs> overlap in our so life. So, too much for for you or I to understand, I, I suspect, right yes. in its entirety. Right, Correct. there'd be subject matter experts far more qualified than other ones. Right? Enough that we understand that it is different, mm. uh, right, and sometimes vastly different, and respecting that diversity and difference. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And not pretending to understand all the intricacies of each culture or... Exactly right. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's a... Thank you for listening to Tales from Tech Titans. And be sure to follow us wherever you get your podcast. If you'd like to get more insights about tech careers, then check out the Ember, that's e double linkedin page, for the latest updates, articles, and engaging discussions.